Hello and welcome to the fifth and final session of Studyology. Uh, so in today's session we are going to be recapping uh, some of the key concepts from the last four sessions, trying to kind of tie it all up and put a nice uh, bow around it, um, but also talk a bit more about how the concepts that we've explored in this program can be applied to our, our life more generally. Um, and that seeing the kind of broader significance of these concepts can sometimes uh, help reinforce them um, at the level at which we're trying to learn them, i.e. in terms of tackling procrastination. So there'll be a kind of a fair bit of revision in today. So if you've not seen the previous sessions, you might actually be able to watch this session and still get some kind of cool ideas out of it. Um, but we'll be making reference to, well, I will be making reference to a bunch of things that I've talked about in previous videos and not going into any additional depth on them. So I still recommend that you've, you've had a look at at least a few of the, the other videos leading into this one. Um, so uh, let's dig in. I've got to move my little picture into the corner, put me down there, shrink me down a bit, and let's kick off. So before we do, I just want you to take a moment, take a few deep breaths, kind of center yourself in your body. Take a quick look around, notice where you are, where you're sitting, what's going on around you. Notice what's in front of you, maybe the laptop screen or your phone screen or computer screen, what else is going on around you. Take a moment to maybe put aside any other distractions, um, turn off uh, social media, maybe put your phone on silent. Um, if you're in a room, maybe you know close the door or uh, kind of set yourself up in a way that it, it, it's unlikely you'll be distracted for the next kind of 20, 30, 40 minutes, however long it takes me to get through this content. And just kind of give yourself and allow yourself the opportunity to, to focus in on this stuff for this point right now. Um, and that you'll be able to return to all those other things later. But that for right now, you're here to learn, gain some new knowledge, gain some new skills that are going to help you develop a better relationship with your study. And if you're arriving at this video, having watched through um, videos one to four, then I really want you to take a moment to um, say thank you to yourself uh, for that process, for putting that time aside for making that investment, um, both in your, your study success, but also your well-being more broadly. Finish with just a couple of more deep breaths. And then let's kick off. So let's recap some of the key concepts from this program and try and pull it all together into the one spot. So at the core of this program is the idea that procrastination is a form of experiential avoidance. And what is experiential avoidance? Well, it's our tendency to want to distance ourselves from, um, eliminate, uh, suppress, or push aside, or avoid situations that give rise to um, difficult or unpleasant thoughts or feelings, sensations, perceptions, memories, that sort of stuff. It's, it's what's going on in here and the tendency to, to want to avoid thinking about or focusing on or exposing oneself to, to difficult content. Right? And difficult content often shows up at the point at which we are working on things that are important to us or working on things that are difficult or challenging. And so study is a context in which sometimes we engage in a lot of experiential avoidance. Because we sit down to study, we've got an assignment to do, we've got an exam to prepare for. Um, we sit down to do it the kind of the full kind of uh, implications of it kind of dawn on us at that moment we realize there's a lot of work to do or it's going to be difficult a range of different negative thoughts and feelings might arise at that point in time we might start to feel a little anxious a little stressed a little overwhelmed we might start to think things like that we're not going to be able to do it or that we're um, that we're going to fail and people are going to realize that we can't do this. So a range of different things can show up at that point that we would consider to be unpleasant or undesirable. And in our attempts to get rid of those, because we, we don't really want to feel that way and we don't really want to have those thoughts, we take actions to eliminate um, or reduce or, or, or lessen those thoughts or sort of distract ourselves from and in the process, often we end up 
disengaging from the study task itself. And that's the kind of origins of procrastination, why it is that we might sit down to do our work, but then 10 minutes later find ourselves um, on social media or on YouTube or in the kitchen cooking or um, out in the rest of the house doing the cleaning or off in the garden doing something else. And so procrastination is a form of experiential avoidance. It means that in the context of study, at some point in time, um, we've come to expect or experience a range of negative and unpleasant emotions. We don't want those thoughts and feelings, um, and we take actions to avoid it, which takes us away from our study. Now, in this program, we've <laughs> suggested that the antidote to experiential avoidance and the antidote to procrastinations is what we call um, psychological flexibility. So if you think of procrastination as kind of quickly falling into an autopilot cycle of avoidance, psychological flexibility is about putting ourselves into a very conscious and aware state of approach. Um, and so there's three components to it. There's a mindfulness component, so it's really um, getting ourselves in the present moment and noticing fully our experience. Um, where we are, how we feel, what's going on, what we need to do. Very much orienting ourselves to the present moment and, and getting ourselves out of thoughts of the past or thoughts of the future, like what is happening right here and right now for me. There's a, an, a, um, opening ourselves up to and making room for some of those difficult thoughts and feelings and sensations that we would otherwise take actions to avoid or push away or distract ourselves from. We talked about diffusion and acceptance as these kind of psychological techniques that you can engage in that allow you to make room for difficult thoughts and feelings. And the psychological flexibility is then also a recommitment to one's um, core values and core goals and, and core intentions. And so in the moment of study, that's a, a, a kind of a restatement of why it is you're studying, why this is important to you. And what is the actual task that I've got in front of me that I need to do that is consistent with um, moving in the direction of those values? And so psychological flexibility is the initiation of all these three kind of processes uh, at the same time. Now, it might look like a lot, but you can move through or put yourself into a psychologically flexible state quite quickly. This might take you know under a minute to, to do some mindful breathing to make room for whatever difficult thoughts and feelings are there and then recommit oneself to, to taking action in, in, in an area that's um, in, in a way that's consistent with what it is we want to do and need to do. It can happen in a very short period of time. The other diagram that, I, um, that we've used a lot or talked about a lot in this program is this one. So this is intended to help you understand where procrastination fits within the kind of broader study experience. So what this diagram says is that um, there's a relationship between our kind of stress level and our performance, that our best performance occurs at a quite like a moderate level of stress, like we actually do our best work in a, in a slightly kind of aroused, slightly stressed, slightly kind of um, activated state. Um, but to get to that state, we have to go through this um, pain of getting started, the walk up the hill, so to speak. Um, and that pain of getting started can take many different forms. It can be confusion, boredom, um, struggling with attention, feeling stuck, anxious, stress, overwhelm, whatever. Um, it might include some thoughts, you know, negative thoughts about ourselves or our abilities or our capabilities. And the experiential avoidance kicks in at this point. Right. We don't want those feelings, we don't want those sensations. We'll take action in order to rid ourselves of them. Um, and the typical way we do that is to disconnect from the activity that, that we perceive is giving rise to them. So we disconnect from our study. And we can do that in lots of many and different imaginative ways. Uh, hopefully over the course of this program you've started to get a bit of a sense of what your unique sort of procrastination profile is. Um, you can go and revisit, I think, session two uh, for that, for the different types of, of procrastination. But of course, if we disconnect from our study here, what does that mean? Well, it means our tasks build up. Um, and then by the time we have to get these done at the last minute, we're in a, uh, in a far more kind of panicked, stressed state 
now. The work we do under stress, the work we do under under panic, is of a poorer quality than the work that we do, say, in this 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 flow state or our ideal state. Now, depending how kind of intellectually gifted you are, um, you might be able to do some pretty decent work in a in a sort of a panicked last minute state, um, and so you'll get through your studies. Um, uh, even though a lot of it is being done at the last minute. But really what this does is start to build up a number of problems over time. So not only are you performing at a lower level than you can, so you never actually get a real sense of what your true ability is, it also means that your time with study is spent either avoiding it or doing it at the last minute. So it's likely to kind of contaminate the experience of study over time. Um, so even if you're getting through at a sort of a marks level, um, so grades and marks level, uh, you're not actually getting the full um, experience of your ability and the full experience of what it's like to be able to work in, in, um, in, in flow states. And so the study experience becomes less rewarding over time. And as the study experience becomes less rewarding over time, it becomes harder and harder to get yourself to actually do this stuff. The other thing that happens here as well is when your um, study experience is really just flitting either between avoidance and panic, um, you build up a lot of shame over that time as well. Um, you build up frustration. Why do I always leave things to the last minute? Why am I always doing this to myself? Why am I always making this decision? And that shame then comes to feature as part of the pain of getting started. It starts to amplify this, this pain component here. And, and shame is a very kind of powerful kind of negative motivator for us um, and so as it starts to build up over time um, and starts to get connected with your sort of work ethic um, it can become quite disruptive and so this knowledge of these two th this knowledge of the of, of experiential avoidance this knowledge of of psychological flexibility this understanding of where um, and the, the the kind of the cycle of procrastination um, leads us to the, the core recommendation of this program, which we finished the last session with, which is that you develop a ritual that you use as an entry point into study. And that ritual contains all the necessary components for a psychologically flexible response to commencing study. So there is a moment of mindfulness, there's activities to get present and in the moment. There are diffusion and acceptance activities to help you um, make room for and make space for those difficult thoughts and feelings and sensations and emerge. And then there's a, a restatement and a recommitment to your core value set, why it is that you're studying, why is it important to you, and a recommitment to the task that's at hand. What is it that I actually have to do in order to be and, and, and be consistent with my values? And I call that kind of ACT in five minutes because ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, is the mode of therapy on which this program is based. And if you're building like this kind of ritual um, into study, you're essentially doing almost the full ACT protocol within a, a very short period of time um, in relation to uh, entering into a study process. And so at this point, it's worth asking yourself um, whether you have developed a ritual, um, what that ritual looks like, what components it contains, have you been applying it and trying it, uh, have you tried modifying it and changing it over time if it doesn't feel quite right, have you tried added adding, uh, adding other things into the ritual. I think I said in session four that this you can build other things into this ritual. For example, you could make a cup of tea, put the cup of tea down and that's when you um, launch into the, the first mindfulness exercise. Or maybe you take a sip of the tea and it's the taste and, and, and warmth of the tea that's the initial kind of mindfulness exercise itself. Maybe there are some study hacks that you add to this as well. So you um, turn off other social media, you put internet blocks on certain sites. Um, there might be other more practical things that you build into your ritual. Um, but the, 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 the need of that ritual to have those core psychological flexibility components is still there. And so ask yourself, have you developed one? Have you been playing with rituals? Have you been experimenting with it and trying it? And if yes, what have you noticed? What have you learned along the way? Um, and what can you use from those learnings to kind of, defy, to, to further refine your ritual? And if you haven't 
been playing around with developing a sort of a, an, an entry point into study ritual, then what's going on? What do you think the block of that is? Is it a knowledge-based thing? Is there something um, about the ritual process that you don't quite understand yet? Do you need more clarification from me? In which case you can contact me. I'll, I'll give my details at the end of the session. Um, maybe is there a psychological block to doing it? Um, is it that this material hasn't resonated with you and because it hasn't quite resonated um, you're, you're more reluctant to sort of put it into place? Um, has it been a practical thing like you just you intend to do it but you keep forgetting at the time and can you problem solve those different challenges um, like I said if it's a comprehension thing contact me if it's a psychological barrier then maybe when we look at some of the additional resources that you could look at maybe there's something that will resonate more for you than this program and if it's a like a practical barrier Maybe it's using some simple reminders like um, reminders on your phone, post-it notes in your study space, things that remind you to, to engage in the ritual at the point at which you're about to enter into the study process. It's also worth, at this point in time, just um, reflecting on how you've gone with this program as a whole. Um, I've sort of put three different levels. Um, they, they don't necessarily capture every response to this program, but they capture the broad responses. The first one being that the program has been helpful and you've used some strategies and, and they've helped you make some progress. The second is that you have learned some things but there are other things that haven't quite worked, either struggled to apply the ideas or they don't seem to be helping. So there's still a bit of maybe trial and error or troubleshooting that needs to be done. And then the third one is that you've, you've gone through the program but there's not really the anything that you're, you're getting from it. Oh, just move my head out of the way. So not sure you've got anything from the program and don't know what you should do next. Um, in which case, uh, you could head straight to the end of the, this presentation. So I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things you could move to from here if procrastination is still an issue and the ideas from this program are not helping. Um, otherwise, uh, well, actually, that would be your best bet is to head to the end and, and have a look at those additional resources and maybe start another journey in terms of tackling your procrastination. And I think it's it's perfectly okay to acknowledge that the ideas in this program um, aren't working for you or aren't resonating with you. Uh, whilst this program has built, been built on some principles that we are confident to reflect um, the current state of the literature with regards to procrastination, uh, there is always the case that we, we have to trial and test these things in our own lives to determine whether they're going to be helpful for us. Okay, so what are we going to cover in today's session? So that was a bit of a revision. Now we're going to cover not so much new material, but maybe really an extension of some of the same material, but we're going to show how it applies to life more broadly. So what we've been talking about is a, um, a study process. We've been focused in on your studies. That's the reason you did studyology. That's the reason we developed this program. We want you to have a better relationship with your studies. We want you to have the tools and techniques necessary to, to tackle procrastination. What we've recommended in that context is that you develop a, a process, a psychological process or a ritual for approaching your study. Um, at the point at which you form an intention to study, you put this ritual in process. It's intended to give you a, a much more mindful and focused entry point into doing your work and intended to disrupt um, the rather automatic often or, or seemingly automatic procrastination cycles that often emerge at that point. And so there's key elements to that ritual. You schedule start times. You do a mindfulness exercise of some sort. You use diffusion acceptance to make room for difficult thoughts and feelings. You reconnect with your values and what you need to do as the next task. Formulate that task and get started. Then if you notice yourself procrastinating, um, you repeat the ritual. And so we could look at that, for example, um, as kind of a, a timeline uh, where we've got forming the intention to study happens kind of back here. Um, and then there might be a gap. So we might this, this, this might represent like waking up in the morning and going, I'm going to have a, a good day of study today or I'm really going to focus on my studies today. We schedule a time to get started. That's when we start the ritual, present and mindful, make room for difficult experiences, a value statement, and we kick off the task. 
And then at some point in time along the way, and regardless of how good the ritual is and how good a process you've had here, you will find yourself avoiding or being distracted or moving off to other things. I do it all the time. This program is not a, um, a recipe for 100% focused attention at all times. It's a recipe for improving one's capacity to redirect one's attention back to the task at hand. So there'll always be times when you find yourself procrastinating down the track. Um, and if you do notice that, um, you repeat the process, right? You go back and you reinstate your ritual and you reinstate uh, your commitment back to the task. And what we're trying to do here is create a counter to these automatic cycles of procrastination which are consistently and reliably taking you away from your study. We're trying to create a process, a very deliberate and thoughtful process that, that takes you and pushes you towards your study. So we're countering that avoidance with an approach task. Um, and you're going to have to do that process a few times before it, um, and maybe many times before you start to weaken um, that, that procrastination tendency. Uh, it's not going to happen that first time around. If you've been really been struggling with procrastination, you'll know that it gets quite embedded uh, into your everyday life, and it takes some time to shift. Now, this notion of approach and avoidance that we've been um, really analysing at the level of study does actually apply to our life more broadly. Um, and so avoidance as a concept is something that we can struggle with across many different domains and it can infiltrate many different aspects of our lives. We can avoid different things. We can avoid objects and, and places in the environment. Sometimes it makes sense to do that. Like It makes sense to you know, avoid or stay away from, you know, a red-bellied black snake, for example, um, as opposed to approach and interact with. Um, but we can also try to avoid objects in our mind, our thoughts and our feelings and sensations, the experiential avoidance stuff I've been talking about. Now, the capacity and the ability to um, avoid exists because at the level of detecting threat and, and avoiding things that, that uh, threaten our safety, it's a very effective strategy, a very primitive, but a very effective um, uh, strategy for avoiding things that are life-threatening. And so we have avoidance circuits in the brain that are relatively easily activated and re easily reinforced. The problem is, is when we start avoiding things that aren't life-threatening, but maybe are uncomfortable or difficult, um, but that we know in the medium to long term are going to be beneficial for us, that are going to help us grow, that are going to make us better people. And so a degree is exactly that, right? A degree is something that in the moment it can be, um, and when we're doing it, it can be really challenging and difficult. And, and um, But we know that in the medium and long term, it makes us more knowledgeable, more skilled, more employable. Um, it's probably going to improve our health and mental health uh, prospects um, and improve our quality of life overall. So it's it's a task or a process we want to stay in contact with, but in the in the actual experience of it at the time, it can be difficult and there can be temptations to disconnect from it. And so one of the reasons why avoidance can get so difficult to to address is that avoidance sort of feeds itself, right? It's a self-fulfilling and a self-driving cycle. So I've got a kind of diagram up here to explain that. So this is avoidance more broadly. So at some point in time, we've come to associate a particular uh, object or situation or place as being dangerous or difficult. Uh, and so when we experience that particular thing, we have a fear response, right? Our body sort of clicks into a fear response. And a number of those aspects feel like anxiety, right? Racing heart, catastrophic thinking, some dread, fear, imagining the worst. Um, our body sort of gets prepped to 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 run or flee from the situation um, and it's a very uh, it, it's a normal part of our physiology but it can feel quite unpleasant and so we want to get rid of that um, and we want to reinstate a sense of safety so we engage in safety behaviors now typically that involves us distancing ourselves from the thing that we perceive as, as causing the problem um, now if we do that we get a reduction in fear which is a good thing. As far as our brain's concerned, a reduction in fear and a, and a switching off of this fear response is a, an indication that it's done the right thing, like it's a success. right? So the brain goes, yep, I've noticed. 
um, and avoided a significant threat. And so now it's got an even more attuned radar for when that pops up again. And in fact, it will probably elicit even a slightly stronger fear response the next time you see it. So you can quickly see that you get into this cycle and get stuck in it quite quickly. So if we look at that, we're using some kind of language, using some study language. Um, the trigger is really experiencing something unpleasant in the context of study, um, a lack of confidence, a um, sense of overwhelm, a sense of anxiety. Some, at some point in time, we'll have a study experience that's not so great, getting something wrong, failure. And so the next time we experience a, a, a study-related event, we get a little bit of a fear response. Um, those same kinds of the symptoms might not be as strong as is in, as if we'd encountered like a dangerous animal out outside, but it can still be a, a strong enough fear response to tell us that there's something not quite right. And so we naturally we distance ourselves from the dangerous thing, which is not only the study itself, but any thoughts we have about study. That tends to reduce our fear in the short term, and the brain says, "Awesome, win! Like I, I've solved it. I noticed a threat, and I avoided it, and I've reduced the fear response." What the brain is almost missing out on is this um, higher level appreciation, though, is that if you stay in contact with study and work your way through it, it's going to actually lead to growth and improvement over time. Instead, the brain kind of reinforces and rewards itself for what is a very um, in the moment kind of uh, response to the reactions to that that particular trigger. Now just to be clear that it doesn't always uh, avoidance responses don't always require fear. Um, we hear this with students kind of um, a boredom response right so they sit down to do study they experience kind of some disinterest kind of like meh feeling in response to it. They have a boredom response, usually, which is kind of a loss of interest, um, a negative evaluation of the activity, uh, usually a loss of motivation, um, and a desire to do anything else that, that's more um, interesting or exciting. And so there are escape behaviours. We escape this boring thing and we seek out activities that are more exciting or interesting or easier. The boredom goes away, so the brain says, win, I've identified. Um, and, and avoid a, a boredom threat. Um, and so the next time we sit down to study, well, naturally it triggers a, maybe even a slightly elevated uh, boredom response. And very quickly we can end up in this cycle where we're avoiding study on the basis of the fact that we're um, increasingly losing interest in it. And of course the more we disconnect from it, the more disinterested we'll be because we don't get the opportunity to actually find out anything interesting about the topic. So, if avoidance is the big problem, um, uh, then what is the antidote? Because we talked about experiential avoidance and psychological flexibility being the antidote to experiential avoidance. What's the antidote to avoidance more broadly? Well, exposure is probably the, the primary antidote, um, the one that we use uh, within psychological therapy, and the one which tends to make sense at a common sense level as well as being um, makes sense in the in the psychological literature. So exposure essentially is putting oneself in contact with an uncomfortable situation on repeated occasions until we start to see the emergence of some of these growth factors. Right. So until a person starts to experience decreased discomfort or their capacity to um, manage or cope with that discomfort increases they experience a kind of an increase in courage or a willingness to, to be in the presence of that particular thing um, where we might actually see some positive experiences emerge and where maybe their interest in that particular situation or, or, or context improves. So we could take an example here, like a really simple one, like a fear of spiders. And so the way you treat someone who has a fear of spiders is to put them in repeated contact with spiders until one or more of these things starts to occur. So what you might see is that after repeated exposures to spiders, a person actually starts to feel less uncomfortable in the presence of spiders. Sometimes what you see is that they continue to be a bit freaked out by spiders, but they're able to cope with that. They're no longer so unsettled by their reaction. 
sometimes they get a little more courageous and, and a bit more willing to kind of push themselves. Um, you also notice that sometimes people start to have uh, more positive experiences, right? So they actually start to notice the different types of spiders or the, the way they're built or the way they move or their, their interest in the topic increases. So they're still kind of freaked out by, by them, but they can also see there's lots of positives um, and interesting things about it as well. And so we keep doing that exposure until we see improvements across one or more of these areas. And so what that looks like in terms of disrupting um, that diagram a bit, and let's maybe, um, where can we move me? Let's just chuck me right in that little corner right there. Um, so we might, in, let's say in the context of study, maybe we've developed a really um, pervasive pattern of avoidance around study so that when we sit down to do any study we pretty much always reliably experiencing experience something uncomfortable um, negative thoughts or feelings or sensations or memories we have a desire to escape right but at that point we implement the routine that we talked about um, we take a moment to get present we open um, ourselves up and make room for some of those difficult thoughts and feelings we do so that we can remain in contact with the activity rather than stepping away or, or distracting ourselves from it. The longer that we can remain um, in contact with that activity, the more likely it is we'll experience a, a reduction in that discomfort, an increase in courage or an increase in positive experiences. The anxiety or the trigger, sorry, the, the event itself becomes less triggering for us allows us to stay um, in contact with it for longer, which down the track really starts to develop a pattern of approach rather than a pattern of avoidance. And so in the cycle of avoidance, this is the point at which everything we've been talking about in this program kind of kicks in. And why does it kick in? It kicks in so that we remain in contact with that activity, remaining in contact with the things that we know are good for us, but that we find unpleasant is central to us moving through um, our avoidance of that particular um, situation or event or feeling. Alrighty, so if there's a, I guess a core takeaway from this material that we presented in the second half here is that uh, whatever it takes, keep at your attempts to engage with your studies. Right. So even if what we did in this program um, didn't necessarily provide you with the toolkit you needed, um, you can look at other tools to use. But really what you want to assess is, is this tool allowing me to stay in contact with study for longer periods of time and more regularly? Because the more regularly and the more repeatedly you put yourself back in contact with the full experience of study, and resist and find ways to manage the urges to disconnect from it, um, the better you'll get at that process, the more rewarding the study process will be. The more you'll learn and, and take on from your studies, the better you'll actually get in terms of the contact. And the, the, the more that, that sense or that desire or that need or intention to distract oneself or move away from it um, will start to decrease. Alrighty, so that brings us to the end, around about 32, 33 minutes. Thank you very much for your attention, um, not only for this session, but uh, for the previous ones as well. Um, remember that you can revisit these materials at any time. So the videos of these sessions and all the materials can be found in this Dropbox folder. I'll make sure that that information is included um, in the description. So wherever you're watching this video, that that link is included there. Um, in terms of kind of mindfulness training more broadly or developing your capacity for mindfulness and being present in the moment and making room for difficult thoughts and feelings and sensations, I can recommend Insight Timer. Insight Timer is a, an enormous collection of, of audio-based meditations, some of which are going to be really relevant to this program. Some are just going to be you know relevant or useful for other reasons. But if part of building a ritual for study involves for you that kind of quiet contemplation, that meditative kind of stillness. Um, Insight Timer is a great place to go to find that kind of content. You'll also find, and remember in previous sessions we talked about the workbook that um, goes with this program. 
Um, so in the last part of that workbook, I've included some where to go next uh, options. Um, if Not only if you maybe want to learn more from this program, uh, but also maybe if this program didn't quite hit the mark for you, where else could you go to, to learn some, some tools to manage your procrastination? So one is if, if it turns out that maybe the issue is less about, less about avoidance and more about study skills, um, then you really want to uh, check out the Student Learning Support Service and their flow topic. They've got an enormous number of tutorials and videos and instructional guides on getting better at the actual skills of academia. If it's less about avoidance and more about just you've got other things going on in your life at the moment, so there are difficult um, challenges happening in relationships, grief or loss, health or mental health, that are making it hard for you to focus on your studies, then I reckon health counselling and disability services might be a sensible next step for you. Um, you can access GPs and counsellors and disability advisors and specialist wellbeing programs that might help you try and find a bit more balance between um, the different parts of your life. If it's a time management issue, so it's really just you've got a lot of things that you need to get done in a relatively short amount of time to do it. Um, we do have a blog post on time management. You'll also find a, a wealth of time management information online. I recommend sort of scouring that, finding a few tools and ideas and implementing them, experimenting and seeing whether they can help. It may be a study space issue. Um, so some people uh, experience a significant increase in productivity just by creating a nicer space in which you study. Um, I certainly do that here. You can see that I do a lot of my work from home. I've created a very um, uh, pleasant and, 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 and nice to be in study space here uh, and workspace. And so I like coming here each morning to do what I need to do. And so do you have a space like that for yourself, a space that you'd like to go to do your work? And if not, can you try and build something like that within what's available to you. Sometimes it's a self-care issue, so sometimes we're just not looking after ourselves more broadly. We're not looking after you know, our nutrition or our, our sleep or, or things like that. Um, if you think that it might be a self-care issue, are you just, you're just not looking after yourself well enough, we've got a, a big uh, self-care mega guide that we recommend that you have a look at. And then I've included a range here of resources, um, other people writing about the topic of procrastination um, that I recommend you have a look at if the ideas in this program don't resonate or you've been having trouble applying them. Um, one of them is a workbook that we put together using materials from the Centre for Clinical Interventions in Western Australia. Another is a website uh, written by the guy who's, who wrote one of the key um, articles on procrastination, one of the key key kind of text, one of the big reviews of procrastination and, and what it is. Um, a, the, a lot of what's in this program was based on that, but he's got a website and you can learn a lot there. And there's another guy who I don't actually know his, his, his background in terms of his training, uh, but he always writes well on topics of mind and, and the way people think. He's got a procrastination website that's worth having a look at as well. And then in terms of wellbeing more generally, if you're not already on Oasis Online, I suggest joining us on Flow. It's a big repository of programs in the wellbeing space here at Flinders. You might be able to find something else that helps you in this space. There's one in particular called Mindfulness for Academic Success, which is run by Maureen and Dave um, in my team. Uh, that takes mindfulness principles, some of which we've covered a little bit in this program and applies them to different um, academic contexts. Uh, you might find that a really valuable program. And certainly the ideas should be consistent with what we've done here in Studiology, but uh, a little bit different, right? A little kind of different angle or perspective on it as well. So, oh, one more thing. So if you did like the ideas in this program, um, the psychological flexibility and experiential avoidance and the, um, the being present and the opening up and diffusion and acceptance and values, then you're probably really going to like acceptance and commitment therapy um, as a model. Um, if that sounds interesting uh, to you, whoops, there's a book called The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris, an excellent guide into um, acceptance commitment therapy as a whole techniques principles theory but from the perspective of you know building a better and happier and more, um, and more productive life um, a more value driven life and so I would recommend that if you've liked the ideas in this program and want to learn more about how to apply them 
And then final, if you've got questions, like if you um, have liked what we've done in this program but you've struggled to develop a good ritual, you're not quite sure what to put into the ritual or there was a component of the um, of psychological flexibility that I didn't explain well or that it, um, you, you, you haven't quite wrapped your head around yet, then please email me. Um, I've put a capital... Uh, F in Ferber there, you don't need to do that. But um, just email me and say, hey, I did studyology, but I don't really understand this concept. Can you help me um, grasp it a bit more? And I'll be only uh, too happy to help out. And so thank you again for, for joining me for this series. Uh, I hope you got something out of it. Um, and I look forward to catching up with you in a, another program or maybe a kind of a studyology alumni event down the track. Um, but uh, otherwise... Take care of yourselves and uh, um, best of luck with your studies. See ya.